So welcome back again. And uh, today we have a special guest, um, to me anyways. Um, I, I've always loved the music of Johann Sebastian Bach. And um, I've had strange, not conversations, I guess he's kind of been coming in and out sometimes. I love his music. There's something uh, very deep about it. And um, in a way, I don't think other composers have managed to do it. And um, other composers have done so. He's correcting me. <laughs> he says there's plenty of composers that have done um, something very deeply religious like he did. However, he um, he had his own unique connection and he's saying everyone's work is great it's just a matter of taste and um i'm kind of doing him um doing him i'm i'm interviewing him um i've been getting uh some um pushing by david bowie he's been kind of hanging around since the interview not every day, but he pops in every now and then. He kind of um, has suggestions, and he's he's very much the producer. <laughs> he wants to produce me. Uh, I, I don't think um, in that way. He's, he's just, I feel um, he's sending out a message. He says, if you're interested in channeling, and especially chaps, he's saying uh, there's not enough men doing this. Um, if you're interested in doing something like this, he's 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 game. He says he's down. He's down to help you out. And um, so, I've already had a few conversations with uh, with Johan. He's saying, "Call me Johan." Okay. And he's he showed up, kind of having an ochre. Ja this one's really bright, but he's got sort of a mustardy um, jacket. And a blue shirt, and he he's not wearing the wig. There's a portrait of him that's kind of very famous. There's many different portraits I've found of him, but there's one that I think is m very much his like his likeness is the one um, that everyone uses because it it does look like him actually. And I'm seeing someone uh, without the wig. He said he he wore the wig only to functions, but he worked at the court, so. It was a very, um, he wore it often, but whenever he got home, he would remove it. And he, he has very short hair. He kept his hair very short. And he's got like a, a balding crown. Um, he's also showing me a picture when he was young, a picture, a mental image. And uh, he was um, quite, quite the young man <laughs> he's he's uh with the hair and uh with his eyes he kind of has these green um greenish grayish bluish eyes they're kind of like in between and um i'm i'm still doing the mother mary i think it looks great on camera so uh mother mary mariam she's correcting me not mother mary <laughs> mariam so I'm I'm doing the Miriam. Miriam's here, uh, visually speaking, with the with the eyes. Miriam really liked uh, dark eyes, cold coal rimmed eyes. Sorry, there's a lot of people today. <laughs> uh, okay, so the voice. Now, what um, struck me about him? He's he, I can't hear it necessarily I, I get like a bits and pieces of it and like it's a fragment um he's got a very deep voice and it's it's really deep like bass like deeper than bass actually and he says I, I couldn't sing um because singing my voice was too low to sing even if if I sang it was too low of a pitch and so there there went my singing curry, he said, but I, I compensated for that, for the singing instruments. But so he, his voice is very low pitched and he doesn't speak very, he speaks very softly. 
But even when he speaks softly, his voice has a very resonant quality. Like, um, you know, like a grave, resonant warmth, like a, um, a Barry, uh, what's the name of the singer? <laughs> Barry White. Thank you. And um, he kind of sounds like a Barry White, except white. <laughs> That's his joke. Um, he's very funny. He's got a good sense of humor. And um, he he shows himself laughing. And also, um, he had two moods. He was very either melancholic or he was funny and, and made jokes and was like to laugh. And... He was sometimes angry only when he was working. He got very angry sometimes at people. Um, he was very demanding, exacting. Um, so he would use his voice like he would he would speak really loudly. Um, it was perfect for speaking over like a choir or a bunch of uh, people um, working together. He would cut through with his voice, the perfect voice, he says, for... Um, ordering people around, kind of a general's voice. Um, the clarity and the deepness of the voice really um, hit me. So I'm, I'm going to do, I can't really do his voice because my, my pitch is too high. But I'm going to try and do my radio voice. So um, so we'll, we'll go that way. So we're kind of, I prepared a list of questions and he's already answered a few of them. But um, I kind of wanted to to go over them with him <laughs> live. Maybe I'm going to get something different or a different kind of connection. So I'm, I'm curious to see what, what extra am I going to get. Because with Maya, I, I got a really good connection with her compared to the discussions that I was having one-on-one. -on -one. So we'll see with him. What, what he's got. So I'm going to try and be um, more structured. Uh, maybe it doesn't matter. Uh, I'm trying new things. So it's kind of more like a podcast right now. So we're going to start the questions. So the first question is Mr. Bach. <laughs> he says, yo, on. <laughs> um, he says, yo. <laughs> he's like... I, he he wants to interject. I want to say that I really love modern music. I'm I'm here for anyone who wants to know more about modern music and to understand how it's made. I I am kind of good understanding of the structure of bass lines and that is the most important thing when you're making music is the bass line because that's what enables the top notes to sing and to resonate at their best quality and that's what i did in my music my my music was about me singing and like i was mentioned before i love to sing and singing was I was jealous of people who could sing, and so I never learned to sing properly, breathe, and all of that. And the melodies that were coming in were very long, stretched. They weren't made for the human voice. So I wanted to be melodic in everything that I did. Melody and singing, the singing of the universe, was what I love. So if you like melody and you want to understand melody, I'm I'm here. You can call on me. Okay. <laughs> so where the music, where does the music come from? Where did it come from? Like it, to me, it feels like you were channeling this music. Am, am I correct? Well, we did have this conversation. He says. <laughs> so yes, I I did channel. A lot of this music there's a lot of music he says a lot of music and it's hard to think that one man could write all of that music but I in a way I did write the music 
I had help. Remember, I had all those children, but all the music was written by me. And I got the energy from source. So was it strange? Uh, was it strange for you to to listen to this music coming in? No. No, it, it wasn't very strange. When I was a child, I heard the music. It was there since the very beginning of my life, so I didn't think it was abnormal or strange. It was God. I was very, very religious, and I was sure that I was hearing the music of God because it was so beautiful, and it sounded amazing and I I never really thought of it being strange or unusual but I never really asked anyone what they thought of it I knew it wasn't satanic like some people might call today I knew that what I was hearing was so beautiful and so pure that it was for sure something sent from heaven, from God. Um, so it, it never really made me question whether it was good or bad what I was hearing. However, I came to realize that I was the only one who had this talent and I realized I was alone in this talent of having this, the, this music come through. I, it was, I guess, my cross to bear to know that this was coming in and there was no one like me that I could talk about with, with them about this. Okay, so next question. Um, did you really play all those instruments? <laughs> hmm. Yes, yes and yes and no. I, I played the instruments. And I understood the instruments because I've had other lives where I was a musician. You have to understand that when you come in, to be a composer, one has to have learned a lot about music before coming in. You don't, you don't get a free pass, as they say. You don't come in like in the Matrix and, you know, source plugs it in the back of your head and you get it. A lot of the composers that you know of have spent many lifetimes being musicians so they can themselves compose music for the instruments or many instruments so i had many lifetimes as different kinds of musicians um to be able to compose that music for keyboard strings it was um it wasn't a one time zap i had to go and get the information i came back with the knowledge to play those instruments but i had to earn through other lifetimes of of practicing and and learning these instruments so if you think it was you know easy it wasn't easy it was simply something i needed to learn to be able to do the music. And the music was simply singing the universe or singing the pattern of the universe. And I came in at a time when contra contrapunctal music was quite fashionable. And that's what I heard in my head, these, these lines, these melodies, these singing parts. The other influence was my family. I 
I know your questions from what I've seen don't have that. You thought you could insert it, but I want to talk about my children. Now, there's a lot of theories why I had all those children. And I want to say that I, there are many reasons why the children, so many children. The first reason is I really enjoyed physical intimacy. And the second one was on some level, I was hoping that one of these children would be someone like me. You see, like I said, I've never been understood in the sense that the music that came from me was a very unique gift. And I thought one of my children would possess this unique gift. But no matter how many children I had, I realized I was the only one who possessed the gift. And although they were all very talented musicians and and equal to me in many senses and perhaps superior in, in others, they didn't have that connection to a source that enabled me to compose the music. And I couldn't share the delight and, and, and the pure joy that I got from hearing this music and channeling this music. I was alone, uh, isolated in my little um, castle, away from any other musicians. And so I made my own flock of musicians. I guess you can judge me by such a selfish act, but at the same time, I did my best to create my own family. And at the time, to have so many children was not something that was considered bad by the church. Only now, today, people say such bad things about people who have a lot of children. But I was not careless. And the children took care of themselves. And I was a good father, a very good father. So you, you, you did mention that you felt alone. So tell us about that feeling of loneliness. I, I think you know, a lot of musicologists and a lot of experts on Bach have noted that uh, sense of loneliness in your music, especially for the solo instruments, the partitas and, and the compositions you've made for cello, violin, um, Tell us more about that. I guess it ties into what you were saying. Well, loneliness is a very human emotion. And I think me as a human coming in, of course, you feel isolated. Many things can make you feel isolated. Um, your skin color, your height, your looks, your shortcomings, being handicapped, being very smart or not being very smart, being autistic, being so many things can make you feel isolated and alone in this in this world because people are always looking for the differences they're looking and if you're not in the average area in that average space your experience will be that of loneliness and even if you are in this average space this you know Jane Doe John Doe space you are still alone. So it doesn't really matter. I think everyone wants to belong, and yet everyone is simply fitting in awkwardly. I had an amazing chance of tasting my own 
uniqueness. And yet a part of me wanted to not be alone. So you always have this opposite drive between loneliness and enjoying yourself. And sometimes you might feel you will be misunderstood by other people. I was misunderstood in the sense that my ideas were ahead of their time. And I was in a court of people that didn't really appreciate any of the things that I did for them. And so I only had myself to please. And I was not a very easy person to please. <laughs> I was in a competition with myself. And so I had to decide what was my challenge each and every time that I played an instrument or I wrote a piece of music. And since there was no one as skilled as I was, I had to be resourceful enough to split myself in two without truly splitting myself in two. And so a lot of the instruments, the violin and and the keyboard and, and, and the cello music, you will hear all these voices because they are all of the voices that I heard and also they are me, parts of me splitting off and singing. And Mr. Gould, Glenn Gould, he, he was a genius in the fact that he understood that. He, when he really tuned in to the music and he really tuned in to me because he did channel me when he played the keyboard that way. And I want to say he channeled not just me, but he found the source behind, he tapped into the energy that I was getting. And that is why it's so miraculous, because he connected to that source. He's my soulmate in a way. A hundred, hundreds of years later, finally someone who understood me. And people are understanding me every day. And I want to say, there's a young girl, you have to pull up her name, um, Hilary Hahn. Hilary Hahn, you gave me the best compliment that I've ever heard, or the best compliment to this music, because I cannot take the credit for it fully. She said, the music, this music keeps me honest. And when I got the music in my head, of course, there's the time that I lived in and the style that was there. And I tried to be as honest as I could. I tried to be a medium that is very precise in the way that I put down the notes to what I was hearing. It was a easy job in the sense that I just had to listen, but it, it wasn't fashionable what I was writing. It wasn't the kind of music that people necessarily wanted to hear at the time. There was Haydn. There were other m musicians that were making light and airy, fluffy music. But me, I was writing this deep music, this, this profound, timeless diatribes of voices running in my head. And I could have changed it and I could have been coy and catty about it, but I decided to stick to my artistic vision, to stick to the voice that was channeling me, the, the music. And whenever someone plays the music, they no, not only have to tune in to 
the music itself, but to the source behind the music and be honest to both. And the more you're honest to the source, actually more than the time frame where the music was written, the more you are truthful to this music. And that's why Glenn Gould had such a success with the music because he tuned in to that part of the music that comes from source and and singing and the singing and the music and the emotion in the music and all the different subtleties and the voices. He got all of them down. Breathtaking, he says. Breathtaking. And Glenn Gould's like in the background. <laughs> Um, he came in and he showed me how he played and that's why he played like this because he was articulating the little ping pong balls of, of, you know, droplets of noises and all of that. So he says, we can talk more about the aloneness if you want, um, if you wish, but there's another dimension to it that I want to explore with you. There's another dimension to the aloneness. Like I said, you know, accompanying myself and the technical difficulties that it involves when you're playing a string instrument. And, you know, people are brilliant because they found exactly the technical aspects to play those songs their songs and dances and whether you think it's possible for someone to write all that music or not it is not important what is important is that you can tune in to the voice in there I, I want to say something how about the, the music is very religious, right? And was that your belief in religion? How, how, did, how did you connect to that belief in religion? My belief in religion is that, yes, I was a Protestant, and therefore Jesus and and Mary weren't part of my worship. We we didn't want to worship humans, if I can say that that way, that you can understand today. We didn't want to worship idols. My music was religious, and I was religious, and that you can imagine someone from that time frame being religious, being, but I, I was writing, how can I convey this? I want to talk about the work. And today, the idea of fame has taken a lot of musicians out of their power you want to be popular and you want to make money and you want to you want to be all of that but the dedication to your craft is more important than anything you could imagine and anyone doing anything creative needs to understand that this is their religion. And so music was my religion before God was religion because the beauty of what I heard and, and what I tried to put on the paper with the knowledge that I had was always, always my first religion to further music, to further the beauty of what was available. And I lived in a bubble. One of my sons would bring something from Vivaldi or 
I would get a piece from Haydn, a piece, not even, you know, I, I would I would just get to see on a sheet of music their notes. I wouldn't even hear the original interpretation of Haydn or Vivaldi. And both of them inspired me. But I'm lucky because I lived in this bubble alone. And part of me, the human part of me, was very sad that I was alone and no one could appreciate fully the beauty and the genius of my music. I was a human with an ego. I wanted my ego to be stroked and at every turn I was demolished, made to feel as if it wasn't good enough or it wasn't pretty enough or it wasn't any of that. But I decided to stick to what I knew I was getting and I trusted and I had faith in the music that I got and there, that's my religion. Again, they both fused. I wasn't more religious than the Duke or any other clergyman, but I believed in the power of the music. And even when people would tell me it was strange music or it was unusual music, I shrugged it. And that's healthy in a way. Now, you don't have to listen to me or listen to anything here. It doesn't really matter. I'm just telling you where this music comes from and how it was put together and and how it was conceived, you know. And again, I want to talk about my family within this music because they are instrumental in in having me having um, a place where I can feel comfortable to be a musician. So my wives and my children were quite important in the making of the music. And they were always there practicing, singing, having fun with the music. And I would hear ideas from them. My my wives would help me write the music, but the melodies and the basic ideas would come from me. But everyone helped me. Everyone helped me out. There was a lot of music to be made, and music is like food. You know, you pull out ham, and you add a bit of this and a bit of that, and it's delicious, and you pull out ham the next day, and you add an, another ingredient or other ingredients and it will taste similar but different so the music that i made is in that way it has a purpose to fill in a church to celebrate something to a lot of that music is 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 good music is is None of none of it is bad music. Was I as pompous and ostentatious as Haydn, or was I as dramatic as Vivaldi? No. It was my music. It was the music. It was honest music. I was an honest man in the sense that the music really reflects who I am. I was a very emotional being. I lived in emotion very strongly, but pomp and circumstance and those things, they were not part of my dialogue, although I did understand them. I wasn't an expert at pomp and circumstance like Haydn was. I didn't make operas because I didn't understand singing the way he did. I hadn't been a singer yet, not a good singer anyways. So my contribution to music is also built on the family and 
like I said, they made me happy and it made me sad because I was always the only one who heard these voices and these singing voices in my head. But in a way, having all these children around playing music echoed what I had in my head, all these voices singing one over the other, different melodies, different ideas, they all contributed to to the music, to the great music, to the great work. So I'm, I'm looking at the questions. I think we answered pretty much all the questions. Um, yeah, there's, there's one last one. Um, tell us about the well-tempered um, keyboard. Well, there's many reasons for it. The first one is I had children and I wanted to teach them. I wanted to teach them about scales and I wanted to teach them about this new method of tuning the keyboard. And so, again, it's this sort of thing practical thing about making music um, it's about you know taking the ham and putting it in C major and putting it in D minor and the same ham in different scales I think music is very particular in the sense that it has scales of different colors and of different tones. Much like painting, it's similar, but not exactly the same, but you can use these variations to paint. So it's about learning the color of the scales. And once you do that, you, you can be a better composer. But again, Composing is not just learning instruments. It's unfortunately a few lifetimes of being a musician and having something to say with your voice. And I, from my human perspective, I couldn't understand that. I thought if they learned what I learned, they'll be able to be like me. I guess that was the biggest lesson is that no matter how much you teach someone what you know and what you think you know, they will always be who they are and they will and you will always be who you are there are certain things you cannot teach certain things that cannot be transferred into someone we really must come and learn these things on our own and i learned to be humble because i had a big ego but being in the environment that I was, I learned that no matter how great the work you are, how great the musician you think you are, if you compare to Haydn or you're better than Haydn or as good as Vivaldi or as bad as Vivaldi, it doesn't matter. In the end, it didn't matter because Haydn will always be Haydn and Vivaldi will always be Vivaldi and my music will always be my music. So there's no real difference between one or the other. It's just the human ego. And I was lucky enough, grateful enough to be put in a place where I could create and have my ego kept in check, which unfortunately today with the internet is not possible. You're always comparing yourself. For me to do the work, I, I had it to be isolated. And it's just simple as that. That, were, that was the condition for the work to be good. It was me and me and nobody else. And even my children and my wives sometimes did not understand the work. One last question. What's your pet peeve regarding any of the pieces that are played? I know you told me this yesterday. <laughs> my pet peeve 
My pet peeve is Toccata and Fugue in D minor. He says, <clears throat> sorry. Can you please, please, please stop playing it like Count Dracula? It's boring by now. It was exciting the first time people played it like that, but now it's just boring. The organ itself can accommodate all kinds of nuances and sounds. Why are you always playing it like that? In the beginning, that beginning, that deep, deep beginning, it is not about angst. It is about space, empty space. It's about creation. It's about the empty space being filled with light. Listen to any other transcription of that music. There's a great one for harp on YouTube. And there's another by the Canadian Brass Ensemble. You will hear that it is about space and light coming into space and not about Dracula coming to suck your blood. <laughs> Although it sounds terrific that way and it opened up musical possibilities for the movies of angst when it's played that way in that very romantic turn of the century way that hasn't changed at all. I'd like to see a woman play this music. It seems only men play it and they play it in that sort of look at me, look how, how powerful I am behind this keyboard. But if you listen carefully to it, there is the light coming in, the universe being created. That is the truth of that music. And if you're not willing to hear the truth of that music, then it'd always be a parody in the way that it is. And it's been a hundred years, so I'm hoping someone soon will give it a new perspective. Do you have anything to add? <laughs> no, we we made we made the the rounds pretty much. And like I said, if you need help in creating melody, I am here. I'm always here. I'm always lurking around where the great music is being made. Even if you're not asking for my help, I'm there to listen, to see. Because I love music, and the music is my religion. And the moment you are religious about anything, music, your talent, then you open your, the door to accomplish great things. And that is the truth, whether you're a musician or a painter, whatever craft you do, when you are passionate and religious about it, and you dedicate yourself every day to it, then only miracles can happen. Only wonderful, beautiful, amazing miracles can happen. Bless you. So I'm asking, are there any other questions for um, Mr. Bach, David? David's like, no, pretty much, pretty much good. <laughs> so there you go. And I hope you enjoyed this and I have a few more videos planned. So and I hope you have a really, really great day and a great week and you take the time to celebrate your father or your, your fathers or any people who made a contribution to the life that you're living as a mentor, a male mentor. They do exist and, you know, they're, it's good to, ha to acknowledge their beingness.